So in this lecture, we're going to go over all the viruses that contain just DNA as their genetic material. Now, there are lots of viruses out there. We organize all the viruses that contain DNA as their genetic material into seven families. We're going to go over six of the families. Again, we really are just going over the top organisms that cause disease in humans. There are other ones out there that we don't talk about that are rarer. Now, the seven families are grouped into these seven families because of the type of DNA they have, uh, whether they have an envelope or not. They're also grouped based on size and even organized uh, based on which host cells they attack. So that's where the families are coming from. So the first way they're organized is the type of DNA. And one type of DNA is double-stranded DNA, which is the most common in most of the families that we're going to cover. There's one family that we're going to go over that has part double-stranded DNA in its life cycle and part single-stranded DNA. And one family that has single-stranded DNA only. It has no double-stranded DNA anywhere in its replication. So we're going to start with our first group, double-stranded DNA. We're going to start with the left, and we're going to eventually work our way all the way over to the right. So we're going to start with our first family. It's the Poxviridae family. And yes, anything in here contains double-stranded DNA viruses. They size-wise are the largest viruses that infect human. You could even see some of these with a good light microscope. It's not gonna look like much, but you'd be able to visually see them. There are a lot of animal pox viruses, meaning they're gonna affect various types of animal, animals and are specific to various animals. However, some of them can get transmitted to humans and cause issues. So lots of animal ones. There are ones that affect monkeys, ones that affect sheep, cattle, uh, lots of different animals, but we just have issues with them with they uh, get transmitted to us. Now, there are two human-specific poxviridae viruses, the smallpox virus and the molluscum contagiosum virus. Both are picked up through inhalation and close contact because the virus itself can't survive very long outside of a host cell. And the viruses, anything in the poxviridae group, are all going to produce lesions in some stage, in some stage form. They, some of them start off as macules, which are just flat red spots, almost like a rash which can progress to papules, as most of them do, which are raised sores. Some of them then, especially with smallpox, progress to vesicles, which then now you have these sores that are filled with a clear fluid, which then can also progress to pustules that those the vesicles that were filled with clear fluid are now filled with pus, where they get the pustules name from. And it's all of these raised sores that happen all over the body is when we started calling it a pox. Now, the first virus we're going to talk about that infects humans is the smallpox virus. It's also commonly known as variola. Sometimes it's also called an orthopox virus. And this particular virus infects internal, organ internal organs, organs. It causes extreme fever, Upwards of 107 can be dead, very deadly, causes malaise or tired delirium, probably because of that extreme fever. The virus itself is going to move through the entire body, through the bloodstream. It is going to eventually go out to the skin and cause those pox marks all over the skin, which is going to leave permanent scars. Now, lucky for us, because it was a very deadly virus, it was a very unsightly virus, even if you survived it, it's a virus we have eradicated. You cannot get this virus anywhere. We can't say, oh, we just eradicated it from the United States and you can get it if you travel somewhere. It's gone. There's nowhere where we have po smallpox virus outbreaks or cases anymore. And the reason for it is we developed an extremely effective vaccine and we vaccinated enough people that no one had the virus anymore so it no longer sp spread anymore. So the virus is gone. Now, it's to the point where because this particular virus is gone, we've eradicated it, that we've actually stopped vaccinating individuals in the United States. We stopped vaccinating them in their early 70s. It's so why vaccinate against something that you have absolutely no chance of ever picking up. However, there is still one group of individuals 
we still vaccinate. Again, in theory, you should never be able to get this particular virus because it's not out there in the environment. But there are stockpiles of these viruses at various sites in the world, mainly United States and Russia, at places like the CDC, that if it should come into the wrong hands, it could be used as a biochemical weapon. And it's the main reason why the one group of individuals that we still vaccinate for smallpox are military. And so if you know anyone that's in the military and has been in the military, ask them to see their smallpox vaccine. Because when you get a smallpox vaccine, you're, giving, you're, you're given the virus, but it's been changed, so it can't actually cause smallpox, but it's still a pox virity virus that's put into the body to trigger their immune system. And so it does actually cause kind of that uh, the papule, the sore, which will leave a scar. So there's always going to be a scar anytime the smallpox vaccine is given. So even if you asked your grandparents to see the smallpox vaccine that they've had, I'm like, they're going to have a scar from it. Again, we stopped vaccinating in the early 70s, though. So only the elderly and only the military uh, are going to have those scars. Now, the other pox virus that affects humans is the molluscum contagiosum, the virus name itself. So the disease is molluscum contagiosum, and the, the virus itself is called the molluscum pox virus. It, it causes a skin disease. It, again, produces some smooth, waxy papules. And so you can kind of see in the picture, they're almost shiny, kind of a pink, shiny appearance to it. That's that waxiness for it. And where those smooth, waxy papules are going to show up is Anywhere you itch, you know, it might get spread. The, you know, by touching one papule to another is how it's spread. You pick it up by skin-to-skin -skin contact, and then by itching, it spreads it. And the typical places that people itch, whether you realize it or not, your face, because you're always touching your face, your trunk, so your abdomen, and your external genitalia are the top three places that people touch and itch. Uh, and that's where you're going to have these papules showing up. Now, the individuals that are spreading this particular virus the most, it's not a deadly virus, it's more annoying and unsightly than anything else. Children, because they just touch everything and anyone. Sexually active adolescents and AIDS patients seem to be at highest risk of picking up this and spreading it. Treatment, they can remove the infected nodules, uh, it can, usually by freezing them off, otherwise they will go away on their own usually takes a few weeks or months, so depending on where you have them, you may want to get them removed sooner than that. Now, anything else in the Pox viridae family, again, are animal viruses. And so we only have issues if we're in really close contact with infected animals, and it usually causes just a mild infection, because these are viruses that their main host is an animal, and we pick it up accidentally. So it might cause some of the pox. It's generally not going to be as deadly. You're not going to have the severe fever, but it can cause scars. A couple top ones that have been higher noted for cases in humans, cowpox. And Edward Jenner was the individual that's credited for developing the first vaccine because he discovered that milkmaids developed this cowpox, these sores on their hands because it was a virus in the cows, and because of their close contact with the animals, they picked up the virus and had these small sores. But he also realized that milkmaids then were immune to smallpox. The viruses were similar enough that the cowpox virus triggered the immune system to recognize smallpox. And so he's the first one that figured out that he could actually take some of the pus and fluid from an open sore and put it in someone else, and they became immune to smallpox. Now, monkeypox, uh, again, you'd have to have close contact with monkeys, and I'm not sure if any of you guys do, but if you ever travel uh, different parts of the world, there's monkeys everywhere. And the number of monkeypox cases are actually on the rise. Again, it's going to cause some sores. It will cause kind of some of the raised lesions. They think the main reason why they're on the rise is because we've stopped vaccinating for smallpox. And the thought was if we vaccinated for smallpox, you might actually have immunity, immunity then to other pox viridae viruses. So um, again, 
it's a concern if you're ever around an area where there's lots and lots of monkeys, you might get some sores. It's, again, not going to be a deadly virus. Now, on to our next family of double-stranded DNA viruses. It's the family of the, the herpes viridae family, and it's the biggest group of double-stranded DNA viruses. So big group, lots of herpes viruses. Now, their genetic material, they all have linear double-stranded DNA. They are the most prevalent of all the DNA viruses. There's lots and lots of different strains, lots of types that just the family of the herpes viridae, it, the virus itself, this family affects about 90% of the adult population in the United States. So that's 90% of all adults have some type of herpes virus. However, everyone thinks herpes, and they're going to think of one particular one right now, but not all herpes are the same. Now, anything in the herpes viridae family is more likely to remain inactive or latent inside of infected cells for years, which means you might not ever show symptoms or might not show symptoms for another 30 years, which means you don't even realize you have a herpes virus in you. So it is a virus that's very commonly known for going latent. Now, all of the herpes viruses that we're going to talk about, there are eight of them all together. They're all called a, herpes, a human herpes virus, HHV, and then given a number. So human herpes virus 1, human herpes virus 2, and they're all just numbered based on the order in which they were discovered. Now, the first human herpes viruses we're going to go over is 1 and 2, and I talk about them both together because they both cause the same type of condition, slow spreading skin lesion. So we talk about them together. Now it was human herpes one and two were also previously known as the human sim the herpes simplex virus. It's now just called human herpes one and two. And again, there are two species. There are two separate viruses, human, human herpes one and two. Human herpes one virus generally causes issues above the waist, causing skin lesions above the waist, and human herpes virus 2 generally causes skin lesions and issues below the waist. That doesn't mean they can't go to another part of the body. They can, but it generally tends to be human herpes 1 just usually cause lesions above the waist. Now, types of infections. Again, they're all named by different areas, different parts of the body that these viruses can cause. If you have cold sores around the mouth, that's called oral herpes. If you've got sores on the genital, didn't have a picture, uh, it's genital herpes. If you've got sores around the eyes, ocular herpes. If you've got sores on the finger, it's called a whitlow. Uh, you can have issues on infants that can pick it up because mom picked it up and then they got it. It's neonatal herpes. And another one is you can have lesions that really tend to show up anywhere on the body and it's called herpes gladiatorum. Wrestlers are the top group of individuals that spread that particular virus and causing that condition. That's why it gets the name the gladiatorum. Now, how it's spread and how we diagnose. Well, the active lesion, the sores, is the source of infection. That's where you're going to have that large quantity of viruses that can spread from one individual to another and it's transmitted. That particular virus just needs to get into some type of crack or cut in the skin. It can also get in through various mucous membranes. Once it gets into the body, it is going to cause, uh, it's going to get inside cells and reproduce inside of our cells and infect neighboring cells and it will actually cause the original cell plus all the neighboring cells to fuse together into this one large structure called a syncytia. So it's the all these infected cells will all fuse together to this big, large syncytia. Now, the human herpes virus 1 infections are generally spread by kids. Um, again, kids are always touching everything. They can be very, very dirty. Uh, human herpes virus 2 is usually spread by sexually active adolescents. So I'm like, those are just the biggest groups that are spreading it. Now, diagnosing an infection they usually are going to look at the characteristic skin lesions. You can visually see the different lesions. If they want to do a more confirmative test, they can do various antibody tests. Um, but a lot of times it's just diagnosed based on visual skin lesions. Treatment, it's, there are different chemicals that are out there 
the main job of the chemicals are just to shorten how long that lesion is there. It is not to make the virus go away. Once you have it, you've got it for life. But if you have an active lesion, those active lesions can then spread the virus to other individuals. So we do have various types of drugs just to shorten the duration of the lesion. They don't cure it though. Prevention is in healthcare, making sure you wear gloves, making sure you're not touching any open wounds or surfaces or any active lesions, especially if you have any cuts or cracks on the skin, um, sexual abstinence or monogamy. Condoms can help, but they're not really that effective because this could be any open lesion touching any um, scratch abrasion on the skin. So they can help a little bit, but not extremely effective. The second her human herpes virus is the human herpes virus 3, also known as the varicella zoster virus. And this particular virus causes two different diseases. So same virus, different diseases, depends on when you get the virus uh, and when it's reactivated. So the first disease that it causes is called varicella, more commonly called as chicken pox. And it's usually causes cases in children more than adults. And children's normally just have a red itchy rash for about three to five days. Uh, if it's in an adult, it's definitely gonna be a little more extreme of a condition. However, because it's a human herpes virus, it can go dormant. And when the same virus becomes reactivated later on, it then causes a condition known as herpes zoster or more commonly known as shingles. So it's usually more commonly found in adults because you pick it up as a child, get chicken pox, it goes dormant later on in life, develop shingles because of it. Now, the how it spread. Well, the particular virus, the chicken pox, also called varicella, is um, highly infectious. Um, it gets generally spread through the respiratory tract. It's spread by touching the eyes. Once it gets into the body, it gets into the bloodstream, travels throughout, and eventually develops into the skin, that's those skin lesions, that itchy skin lesions for about three to five days. Now, children, again, generally don't suffer anything worse than just some itchy red skin lesions for three to five days. However, adults, which have a stronger immune system, which means they're gonna have a stronger immune response, are gonna have a more severe case. So if an adult picks up chicken pox, they're gonna have a more severe case. They're still gonna have the itchy red lesions. It's usually gonna be more extreme, so it's gonna last longer, but it's usually accompanied by a really high grade fever that for a lot of individuals uh, will cause them to be hospitalized. Now again, if you've got chicken pox, the virus is in the body and it can become reactivated then. Years later, and like sometimes it's years, sometimes it's decades later, this virus reactivates, and when it does, it always reactivates along a spinal nerve. Now, I'll come back to that picture that was just there. So when it reactivates, it always reactivates along a spinal nerve. And whatever that spinal nerve controls for the skin is where you're gonna have a very painful lesion. And so this particular spinal nerve on here controls the skin in this one area. And that's what we're seeing here. You end up having this big, long line. The rash didn't just want to hang out in a line. It's because it's this part of the skin of the body is all controlled by one particular spinal nerve. And that's that virus that's reactivating along that particular spinal nerve. It can reactivate along any spinal nerve. But you end up with that very painful lesion always in these linear forms. Now, diagnosing chicken pox, a lot of times is just visual, the characteristic itchy red lesions, um, past medical history, uh, if the family all had it. Shingles, it's a little hard to distinguish. They have to generally go based on past medical history, if you've had chicken pox or not. Um, again, it can reactivate along a lot of different spinal nerves, uh, but a lot of times they'll do an antibody test showing the presence of that you've been exposed to this particular virus. Treatment, chicken pox is gonna go away on its own. The itchy red lesions, the scratching, it'll all go away. Shingles, it's managing the symptoms. It's a painful rash. So it's just telling individuals to wear loose clothing, to not irritate the lesion, taking pain meds, but those that rash can last for weeks. Now, prevention, 
I'd say can be difficult because the virus can be spread before symptoms even occur. However, we have a vaccine. Uh, we have a uh, we have the chickenpox vaccine, and then if you've ever had chickenpox, we now have a Shingrex vaccine. That's a two-dose vaccine that works really effective at boosting your immune system to keep that back that virus at bay. Now, the question I always get is, well, some younger individuals in the class have had the chickenpox vaccine. And then the question is, well, if I've had the chickenpox vaccine, will I get shingles? You won't. You're vaccinated against the virus. Shingles is just because this virus is in the body and reactivates. If you've been vaccinated against the chicken pox, it means you don't have the virus in the body, so it can't reactivate. Myself, I've had chicken pox, so yes, I've had herpes. Again, it's not all the same kind of herpes when you say the word, because uh, chicken pox is a herpes virus. And so I know I've got the virus in my body, and at some point I'm going to need the Shinkrix vaccine to boost my immune system to keep this particular virus uh, kind of at bay and dormant. Now, the next human herpes virus 4, because again, there's a lot of human herpes viruses. So human herpes virus 4, also known as the Epstein-Barr virus, it's spread or transmitted via saliva. It then spreads to epithelial cells, into the bloodstream, and it targets your B lymphocytes, your B cells. Now, it causes a condition more commonly known as infectious mononucleosis, which we usually just shorten to mono. The problem is you have infected B cells. And if you have a virally infected cell based on our immune system lecture, your T cells, specifically your cytotoxic T cells, are gonna recognize infected cells, virally infected cells, and kill them. So you have T cells now calling, killing B cells. You truly have a civil war amongst your immune system. One immune system cell is now killing another immune system cell. And that's when we get all the basic symptoms of mono. And the basic symptoms of mono, sore throat, fever, tired, enlarged spleen, enlarged liver. Some of you have experienced this, some of you maybe not, but you know someone that's had mono before and you know the symptoms. Now, for those that already have a T cell deficiency, it can cause some very extreme, rare, but very extreme diseases. Now, usually T cell deficiencies usually come from um, sometimes elderly, sometimes malnourished individuals, but definitely those that suffer from the HIV virus, the, the AIDS. Now, these are some of the diseases that are associated with the Epstein-Barr virus. Now, this is based on your immune system. Pretty much if you have absolutely no immune system, such as those that are in the AIDS stage of HIV, you can develop a condition called oral hairy leukoplakia. Now, you're Tongue doesn't actually get hairy, but you can almost get these cancerous growths on your tongue. If you have a poor immune system, so it works, but it's not a great immune system, you're immunocompromised, it can cause Burkitt's lymphoma, nasopharyngeal cancer, and it's linked to Hodgkin's lymphoma and chronic fatigue syndrome. Now, if you have a normal immune system, meaning, you know, your immune system works, but it's not awesome, it's not an adult, fully working, awesome immune system, kids are generally asymptomatic. It's once you've got that adult, super strong immune system, you're gonna have a more vigorous civil war. I'm like, because you're gonna have more T cells killing more B cells, your symptoms are gonna be worse. And so the immune system is great, but sometimes the immune system, when it's in a civil war with itself, is going to cause all the symptoms that come with this particular virus in mono. Now diagnosing someone with mono, they can look at the characteristic signs, past medical history, you're tired, you're fatigued, I'm um, like you know someone that's just had it. They can do a confirmation though, we do have mono spot tests that are going to give a quick, quick result just like those tests that we did in lab with uh, strep throat. They can also do an ELISA test looking specifically for the organism. Treatment, if you develop some type of cancer based on this particular virus, they can do chemotherapy. Mono, they're generally gonna just treat the symptoms, go home, sleep, rest, things like that. Other conditions, we don't really have any good effective treatment for the other conditions if you're immunocompromised. 
best prevention, um, which can be hard because it is spread in saliva and the symptoms generally, uh, I was going to say, I'm like, a lot of times they can be spread before symptoms even appear, which means you have no idea you're harboring the virus and you can be spreading it. And so best prevention, good hygiene, proper PPE. And I'm like, this is the best way to try to limit it, but it's still going to be hard to prevent it because you just don't know you have it before you're spreading it. The next human herpes virus, so many herpes, so many herpes, is called is human herpes virus 5 called the cytomegalovirus. Now, it's called that because when it gets inside in host cells, it will actually cause the cells to enlarge. So cytomegalo just means large, virus of large cells. And it's an extremely common infection in humans. They say about 50% of adults in the United States that have been tested for it are positive for it. But for most individuals, asymptomatic. But it's so common because this particular virus is found in bodily secretions. It's found in saliva, and mucus, and milk, and feces, urine, semen, cervical secretions. Um, the top ways that it seems to be spread. So it can be spread a lot of different ways. The top ways that it seems to be spread where you have a higher concentration of the virus is during sexual intercourse. But again, most people are asymptomatic, no issues whatsoever their entire life. However, it can cause some complications in fetuses. It has been known to cause birth defects. In newborns, it's been known to cause anemia or jaundice or microencephaly. Um, in, in some immunocompromised patients, it's been known to cause pneumonia or even blindness because it can target the retina. Again, rare. Uh, it's not a virus that causes a lot of serious conditions, um, and it's pretty rare, but it's another herpes virus out there. Now, when they diagnose it, they're going to look for those enlarged cells. Now, other than the fact it has enlarged cells, it has these dark staining inclusions. So sometimes they nickname these cells the owl's eye cells because there's these super large cells, and they usually have these two big dark inclusions in them. Now, to do another confirmation, they can do an ELISA. They can look specifically for this viral DNA. Treatment, fetuses and newborns, it's difficult because normally the damage Damage is typically done before testing is done. If it shows up as an eye infection, which it can, they, we do have a drug called fomavirsin, which can slow the virus in the eyes, but we don't have a vaccine for this particular virus. But again, for most individuals, asymptomatic. Best prevention, abstinence, safe sex, using condoms, mutual monogamy, all of those will all help limit how this particular virus spreads. Now, the next two viruses, the last two we're going to talk about is six and eight. Um, no, we're not going to know. We're not going to talk about seven, uh, only because there's still some unknowns with human herpes virus seven. We know it causes some skin infections, but the how, we're not completely sure yet, so we're not going to go there. So our next human herpes virus six causes a condition called roseola. Now, based on its name, it causes a pink rash on the face, neck, trunk, and thighs, kind of right down the middle line, midline of the body. And again, that pink is kind of that rose colored, which gets its name. There also seems to be some possible links. It's still, they're still looking uh, to do some confirmation, but it looks that there's an increased chance of multiple sclerosis with this particular virus. They're still trying to, again, do some confirmation. Um, the biggest issue is just develops a pink rash, um, just another rash. It will go away on its own without any long-lasting issues. The last human herpes virus is eight. It only affects those that are of the weakest of the immune system, so AIDS patients, and it can lead to a condition known as Kaposi sarcoma. It's a cancer of the blood vessel walls. So it gets in there. It causes a cancer of the blood vessel walls, which causes the bursting of the blood vessels because the cancer the blood walls are damaged and so all of these red spots that are all over the skin that's bursting blood vessels you have blood vessels very close to the surface of the skin in the mouth and so when they start to become cancerous you can see those cancerous blood vessel walls again only affects those that have really no working immune system whatsoever so AIDS patients now away from the herpes viruses and on to our third of our four double-stranded DNA families, and it's the Papillomaviridae family. It causes 
infections known as papillomas, also more commonly known as warts. Now, a wart or a papilloma is a benign growth of epithelial tissue. So your cells were reproducing uncontrolled, and then it stays right there. Now, those growths can really happen just about on any body surface that you can imagine. And they can be painful, they can be unsightly. There are some strains of papillomaviruses that can cause genital warts, which increase your risks of certain types of cancers. They're transmitted by direct contact with the body or direct contact with an inanimate object that someone that had a wart had contact with. An example, a shoe. If you had a wart on your foot and then you put on a shoe and someone shared that same shoe right after you, and I'm like, you can pick up this particular virus and then have warts on the foot. You can also do something known as auto-inoculation, which means you can inoculate yourself over and over again. So if you have constant contact with that wart, you can have warts show up on other parts of the body. Now, this is just to show some pictures of warts. Again, they can show up anywhere. They can be unsightly. They can be very painful to diagnose. It's usually just based on observation. You can see them very easily. However, some genital warts, they might have to do a pap smear for, and they're really looking because they want to know if any particular cancer might uh, develop because of there are some strains. It's not just one kind of virus. There's lots of strains of this virus. There are some strains that are more likely to cause cancer. Now, treatment, they can remove the warts. You can surgically remove them, you can freeze them off, you can cauterize them off, you can laser them off. There's various chemicals you can do to remove them. Lots of ways to remove a wart. If you developed a cancer because of this particular virus, they might have to do some type of radiation or chemotherapy to treat the cancer. Prevention has become difficult. There are lots of strains of papilloma viruses and they're spread very easily. So to prevent yourself or to decrease the chance of picking it up, um, abstinence, mutual monogamy, I'm going to say good, good hygiene, not touching random things, not sharing shoes, can decrease your chance of picking up different strains of the virus. And we do now have a vaccine from some of the sexually transmitted one, which again is starting to decrease the number of cervical cancers. The cervical cancers, as well as a lot of other uh, reproductive cancers, are caused by various human papillomaviruses. So as we're curing viruses, we're curing cancers. And on to our last group of double-stranded DNA is the adenoviridae family. Now, the adenoviridae family, a lot of common colds is what this particular virus group causes. Again, there are lots of different viruses that can cause the common cold, and there are well over 30 different adenoviruses that can cause the common cold, and there are various strains of even of those. They're all spread by respiratory droplets. They can survive on surfaces. They can survive in water that's not treated. So they can be spread by respiratory droplets or touching infected surfaces. Now they generally cause some type of respiratory infection. It's your basic cold, your sneezing, sore throat, cough, headache, tired, all your basic common cold symptoms. Some strains can also affect the intestinal tract leading to diarrhea. So if you've got a cold and you also have diarrhea along with it, it's a good chance it's an adenovirus. But it can also cause, uh, affect the conjunctiva of the eye causing conjunctivitis, more commonly known as pink eye. Now, my little note, there are bacteria that can cause pink eye, and then there's viruses, like the adenoviruses, that can cause pink eye. But they're, one's caused by a bacteria and one's caused by a virus, which means one's treatable with an antibiotic and one is not. Big way to know what kind of pink eye you have, if it's bacterial or viral. Bacterial pink eye will always get that really goopy, greenish, yellow pussiness that comes from the eye. That's bacterial pink eye. That can be treated with antibiotics. Viral pink eye, your eyes are just bright pink and you don't have any goopiness whatsoever. Still looks like pink eye. However, you have a common cold and it will go away on its own just like a common cold will go away on its own. 
Now, we do have vaccines for some strains of adenoviruses, and right now they are giving those to various military just because of how concentrated they are uh, and they can be spread quickly. It just decreases how many colds they can get. We're working on more vaccines, but there's so many viruses that can cause the common cold. I don't see us preventing all of them. Now, on to our next group. There's only one family that has part double-stranded DNA and part single-stranded DNA in its replication, and it's the virus called Hepadnaviridae. Now, anything that has this Hepad or Hepat in it has something to do with the liver. This is no exception. The Hepadnaviridae virus, this is a hepatitis B virus. And so it causes hepatitis B infections. Now, the word hepatitis, anything that ends in itis means inflammation. So hepatitis is liver inflammation. Now, if your liver becomes inflamed, the top symptoms that always follow it, jaundice. So you're going to have yellowing of the skin, yellowing of the eyes, liver enlargement, abdominal distress. Sometimes you can have bleeding underneath the skin. That's pretty extreme, but it can be possible. Uh, now, it generally goes away on its own without any long-lasting issues. However, if you also have the hepatitis D virus, which we haven't talked about yet because it's in our next PowerPoint, because it's a RNA virus, um, if you got two of those together, it's called a co-infection, and that's where you can develop permanent liver damage. So hepatitis B, I mean, it's not great, but it generally shouldn't cause permanent liver damage unless you also have hepatitis D. Now, hepatitis B, the virus itself, the virions, will con congregate um, and collect in saliva, in semen, in vaginal secretions, and a whole bunch of them found in blood. So it's a big one when we're concerned about bloodborne pathogens. And it's transmitted infected bodily fluids with any broken skin or mucous membranes. It takes very little virus to get in the body and cause disease. Now, many individuals asymptomatic or mild symptoms, but if left untreated long enough, it may cause liver damage. The vaccination, because we do have a vaccine, I'm like, does decrease the number of cases of hepatitis B infections we see, but anytime you do damage to any organ, even if it repairs itself, it will always put you at an increased risk, increased risk for developing a cancer of that organ. Now, hepatitis B infections are diagnosed as they're going to look for a particular viral antigen called the Dane particle. So it's these individual, you know, they almost have like round and uh, kind of a cocci and a bacilli shaped particle to it. So they're going to look specifically for those particular antigens. Treatment, we don't have any universal treatment. We've got various antiviral drugs. Um, they're moderately successful for some, but it's not for everyone. So we don't have a good universal treatment to give to someone that has a hepatitis B infection. The best thing to do is just not get a hepatitis B infection and get vaccinated. It's a three-dose vaccine. After we develop the vaccine, the number of cases of hepatitis B went way down. And once you get all three doses, the, your immunity lasts for 20 years, if not your entire life. So it's a very effective vaccine. Otherwise, other preventions, abstinence, monogamy, universal precautions, making sure you've got proper PPE on, disinfecting surfaces with bleach will all decrease your chance of picking up this virus. And then finally, our last DNA family, and it's made up of single-stranded DNA. And there's only one single-stranded DNA that affects humans, and it's the Parvoviridae family. Now, of all the viruses in the Parvoviridae group, there seems to be quite a few animal viruses. Uh, so lots of different animal diseases. Size-wise, they're the smallest of DNA viruses, but the one that causes or is pathogenic to humans is the B19 virus. Now, it causes a condition or a disease called erythema infectiosum, which means red, anything, or erytha means red, um, red skin. So it's redding of the skin. But it also gets a nickname called the fifth disease because in the early 1900s, we didn't have Google, we didn't even have computers. And so when, uh, in, when patients came in, especially children with rashes, with anything, there was lists of everything. Uh, and there was a list of these are the top things that cause rashes in children. 
And this particular virus was number five on that list. So it's also called the fifth disease. Now, sunlight, it's going to aggravate it, but really the only main symptom is it has is that it causes the skin, usually in the face, usually in the cheek, to become very red. But it goes away on its own. It is spread by respiratory secretion, so coughing, sneezing. Sunlight's going to aggravate it um, and cause it to become redder. But because of the red cheeks, it also sometimes gets the nickname of the slapped cheek syndrome as well. But it's just another virus that usually uh, causes issues biggest in kids more than adults. So that's the end of the DNA viruses. We're going to tackle the RNA viruses next.